Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you this morning as those who hunger and thirst for you. God, we need you. And we invite you into the preaching of your word. We invite you, Lord, to penetrate our hearts through your word. And Lord, I ask you to let me get out of the way that you might speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. You know, as I've grown older, I can look back on many life experiences that, and see how God has used them to teach me exactly what it was he's wanting for me to be as a man of God. And often these, these memories are about the miraculous, the things that God has done that is, and we've told you about some of them, of how God has moved in power in ways to reveal to us that we could trust him to take care of our needs, to protect us in whatever he called us to do. However, some of the most important recollections I have are of those in areas of principles of life where God has taught me things through life experiences. He has taught me to prepare me where he was going to lead us. As I was thinking about these passages that we've read this morning, this week, I I remembered something that happened 37 years ago. Now, as you know, when you get older, you remember those things that happened 37 years ago. It's what happened 15 minutes ago that you struggle with. But some of you may recall that the government deregulated the the trucking industry in 1980, and it wreaked havoc upon the industry. Everybody and his brother got into the industry, and and the economic turmoil was was terrible for a while. As an owner-operator, I... It impacted my ability to make a living for my family, and so I decided to sell my truck and get off the road. I ended up getting a sales job with a national maintenance supply company where we sold fasteners and cutting tools and welding alloys and all kinds of chemicals and all kinds of things that were designed for the construction and transportation industry. And they sent me to a class that was designed to get me started, and. And they trained me on certain products that I would lead in with to the customer that was guaranteed to to make them get excited about what we had. And I finished this one week training class, I was stoked. I mean, I was ready to get out there and, and show everybody what I had. It was guaranteed to make them salivate and, and new friends would abound, I just knew it. And so uh, by Going there the first week, and I'd never heard of the company before I went to work for them. But I found that almost everybody in my territory had heard of them. And it had some pretty bad experiences with previous salesmen as well. As a matter of fact, they were very well acquainted with the demonstrations that I was going to show them. They could have done them for me. (laughs) I soon realized that almost no one was itching to buy from me. And if I was going to make a living doing this, I was going to have to actually sell it to them. I was going to have to work to earn their trust. And that's exactly what I did for six years. I set sales records. I became the district manager. But I worked long hours. And I did not give up. I believed that our product line was second to none and that ultimately It would save the customer in downtime and labor costs. I believed it. But they had to believe that I believed that to give me a chance. I experienced a lot of rejection. And the majority of those that I called upon never bought from me, but enough did that we made a comfortable living. And this principle has served me well as a Christian. I'm fully persuaded that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, And he is Lord of Lords. And he's the only way for men and women to find find eternal salvation and to escape the coming judgment that God has against sin. However, I've also found out that almost no one is lined out in front of the, the door of the church waiting to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so we have got to go and tell people the story of what he has done for us 
over and over again. From the Garden of Eden until now, there has been this battle between the kingdom of darkness and God the Creator, who according to Psalm 104, 2 says, He wraps Himself in light as a garment. Every one of our passages this morning points us to this principle of speaking the truth of God's Word to those who are unaware and who are in rebellion to it. Our passage from Jeremiah 27 to 13 is the sixth of Jeremiah's complaints to God for having to pay such a price for speaking the truth that God has placed in his mouth. He sent to the nation of Judah. And every time he speaks, he pays a price. At the beginning of chapter 20, the, the chapter we read on, there's, a, there's a, a priest named Peshur who's angry with Jeremiah because he's, he's prophesying God's judgment is going to be poured out on Judah. And so he, Israel, Judah has refused to obey God and to be faithful. And so Jeremiah is pounding them with God's word and they get mad. And Peshur, he arrests him and he puts him in stocks and he's there all day long and all throughout the night. And then finally in the morning, Pasher releases him. And Jeremiah complains to God. And that's what we were at the beginning of our passage this morning. This is Jeremiah complaining to God in, in verses 7 and 8. Oh Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. Jeremiah had never wanted to be a prophet. And he had objected from the very beginning of his ministry that he wasn't the type to do such a thing. Listen to Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, Ah, oh, Lord, God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. But what God had not revealed to Jeremiah, what was what it was going to cost him to be a prophet. And even though God did not allow his enemies to destroy him, he suffered physically, he suffered emotionally at the hands of those who hated his, his prophecies. He admits there were times that he wants to run away and refuse to speak the words of God but he finds that he cannot hold them in. He says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. And though he complains in his pain and his frustration, the unfairness of what God has done in calling him to be a prophet... And he testifies that even his close friends have, have turned against him and they want revenge against him. But he finds they're unable to do so. He says, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior and therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. And their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. Almost as soon as his complaint against God is spoken, 
There is that thing within him that wells up within him and will not allow him to complain anymore. Instead, he says, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Throughout the book of Jeremiah, we see this theme played out over and over again. Jeremiah is given words to speak to Judah to the king of Judah, to the priest, or to the people. And they react by threatening him and beating him and imprisoning him. But one of the most important things that we see in the book of Jeremiah is that he develops a deep love for the people of Judah. And you can see in this book that Jeremiah mourns the hardness of their heart. He knows what it's going to cost them to have turned away from a holy God. He longs for them to repent and to turn back. But he can see there are stiff-necked people and they're going to lose their inheritance and they're going to go into exile. Jeremiah is thought to have written the book of Lamentations, which follows the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Lamentations, he He challenges God in some ways about, Lord, have you you not been too hard on your people? God, really, did you need to do this? God, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to release them, to forgive them. But there's always this crying out, God, I'm asking you to do that because I know that you're a God of, of tender mercy, a God of compassion. And because I know this about you, I will not stop praying this for your people and my people. Why would he do that after they had beat him? They had imprisoned him. It's because he had encountered God. And it had had changed his heart. The words of God had burned in his heart. And now he speaks the very heart of God for the people of God. And that's what happens when you encounter the living God. In Psalm 69, we read this morning, we find King David crying out to God. It's a lament that he makes because his enemies are trying to destroy him and and they've accused him of things he didn't do and wanting him to restore things that he never stole. And he sees all this happening because of his love for God. And that love had attracted the hatred of his enemies. And he says in verse 7 of Psalm 69, For it is for for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons, for zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me and when i wept and humbled my soul with fasting i became it became my reproach when i made sackcloth my clothing i became a byword to them i'm the talk of those who sit in the gate even the drunkards make songs about me the apostle paul quotes the last half of of verse 9 in Romans 15, 3, in reference to Jesus Christ being willing to, to deny himself and suffer for the benefit of others. As in, Paul is saying to the, the church in Rome, this is how you must live. This is the model that I want you. Even David had this model, and Jesus, the Messiah, had this model. He says, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. King David, the greatest king of Judah and of Israel, the one whose throne would be called the throne of God, the Messiah, who was called the son of David, suffered greatly because he chose to follow faithfully the Lord as God and King. The King of Israel served the King of Kings. In our Gospel reading this morning from Matthew chapter 10, Jesus warns the disciples that persecution is what was going to happen to them. And he gave them instructions as to how they were to act. He said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
So be wise as servants, serpents, and innocent as doves. It's interesting that Jesus begins this statement by saying, Behold, which simply means pay attention. I am sending you. Even though it seems foolish to send out defenseless sheep in the midst of ravenous wolves, that's what I'm doing. And in the midst of them, you're to act as wary and as careful as serpents. But you're to be as innocent and guileless as a dove. They were not to foolishly charge out seeking martyrdom. They were to be wise, and even when they came into places where they were trying to attack, they were to leave, not hang around. But on the other hand, they were not to seek trouble. But they were not to make plans and strategies, and they were not to take things with them. They were to act as innocent as doves, just purely being faithful and going in faith that Jesus was sending them, and the result would be what Jesus wanted it to be. And that was enough. And Jesus says, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be dragged into courts before governors and kings for the sake of Christ. But he gives them a reason why it's going to happen, so that you can bear witness before them and the Gentiles, so they too can hear about me and my glory. Because Jesus was sending them out and would fill them with his Holy Spirit, they had no reason to be concerned about what they were going to say at that time. He said, because what you need to say will be given to you. You just be faithful to go out. They should expect their own families would turn against them. And they will be hated because of their commitment to Jesus Christ and the building of his kingdom. He points out that if they're his disciples, they're going to be treated just like him. And they should not expect anything less, nor should we. All the reasons that the disciples could give for not being willing to be sent out are being addressed and answered in this passage. It's important to note that these reasons, the objections, are very similar to objections that we come up with today for why we don't evangelize and why we don't share our faith with those around us. Let's break down these objections and see that the answers, what the answers are that Jesus gives. Objection. Well, I don't know what they would say. What I would say to them if they, if they question me. Answer. Don't worry. It will be given to you when you need it. Objection. I don't feel that I'm called to go out as a sheep among wolves. Answer. Pay attention to the fact that I am sending you. Will you follow my direction? Objection. I'm afraid. I just don't have the courage. And Matthew 10, 26 to 28 says, Have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Objection. How do I know that God will go with me and not leave me stranded alone? Answer. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Objection. I'm not denying Jesus before men. I just don't want to go out before men. That's my point. Answer, behold, 
I am sending you out. Will you follow my direction? The time that Matthew was writing this gospel, which was sometime between A.D. 60 and 70, the church was very young and they're going through severe persecution. It's coming from the Jews as well as the Romans. It's coming from every quarter, from the pagans, from Jewish leadership, from those who are now the Gnostics who are teaching that Jesus was not even material. He was a figment. He was a spirit. Or that if he was material, he was not divine. He did not resurrect. The church was plagued with these things every day. They're being challenged. But through all this, the church grew and became strong. Because those who had encountered Jesus Christ and were fully convinced of his identity and the importance of the gospel message going forth to the whole world were willing to give their lives to that above all else. The church that we have today has survived on the backs and the testimonies of those who fought the good fight and ran the race. Hebrews 12, 1 calls them our cloud of witnesses. The problem is we now live in a time very similar to the first century church. It's grown weak and allowed the culture to be a greater influence to us than we are upon the culture. We live in what's now called a post-Christian culture where a large majority of our, our population have no knowledge of God or of His Word. And our culture reflects a society that has chosen to live without God, but to live for itself. For most people, God and His church have become irrelevant. But you and I both know that the church and God has never been more relevant than it is today. And there's never been a greater need than it is today for Christians to go out as sheep among wolves. Our epistle reading from Romans chapter 5, 15 through 19, Paul perfectly expresses the hope found in Jesus Christ versus the hopelessness of those who are left in the sins of Adam. Eugene Peterson paraphrases this in a, in a simple phrase that does a beautiful job of summing this up. He said, here it is in a nutshell. Just as in one person did it wrong and got us all in this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong one man said yes to God and put many in the right. As the people of God, we must return to the same commitment to the gospel message as the early church. No matter what it cost us in time or money or our lives. Nothing else, nothing else can be as important to the mission of the church and to Christians as gospel. God has called us to be light in the midst of darkness. Many of you were here last week when Dr. Richard Pratt gave us a wonderful teaching on Friday night and Saturday and then Sunday when he preached to us. But he encouraged us to live our lives to the glory of God and to the building up of His kingdom. Anything else was idolatry. He encouraged us to see our lives as running a relay race where we're called to run as fast as we can and by all means do not drop the baton. And that's what he shared with us the work being done by third millennium in providing a seminary education for free to pastors around the world so that the gospel can go forward around the world so that men and women can hear about Jesus Christ and hear good, sound teaching. We took up an offering. I hope we can continue to do that. We should support such ministries. 
We have one of our own leaving in a couple of months, going to a place for a long-term mission trip, a place that is dangerous, a place where there are very few churches, and her life will be in danger. But God is calling her as a sheep to go out in the midst of wolves, and we should support that. She has financial needs. We need to meet those needs before she leaves. We support Anglican Frontier Missions. We support Anglicans for Life. And a lot of different ministries that are taking the gospel in various ways around the world. And we should do that. But there is no substitute for us as a local church. And for us as individuals to give our lives to the proclamation of the gospel here in our own area. And in our own families, our own friends. It will cost us. It will cost us in time. It will be inconvenient. It may cost us money. And you know what? It may cost us our lives. But those who are willing to follow Christ at all cost, they reveal that they see Him and His promises for what they are, the greatest treasure. And for those who are unwilling to give all that for the sake of Jesus and His kingdom are revealing that they don't see the offer as worth it. And there are other treasures that are more important to them. Again, they should remember the warning that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You know, I ended up being pretty successful selling maintenance supplies because I told the story of my products over and over again. I didn't know how they were made. I only knew they worked. Brethren, you don't have to be a scholar or a theologian to tell the story of how Jesus has changed your life. You just need to tell it to anyone who will listen. We live in a world that's become antagonistic to the gospel. And guess what? It's going to get a lot worse. Other cultures are impacting us. Other cultures reveal what happens when you walk away from God. It becomes dangerous to proclaim his name. And yet the church is growing in those cultures because they see the treasure of the gospel. And they see the promise that if we will glorify Jesus Christ, he will glorify us before his Father. Now's the time for you to make a decision about who you are going to serve. Are you going to serve God, whatever that means? Are you going to serve your own comfort? There are people that are waiting to hear the hope that you have found in Christ because they have lost all hope. There are some who hate the very idea of Christianity and it's because their eyes and their hearts have not been opened. You need to take that chance. You need to be faithful. I need to be faithful. And so God is calling us today to choose who we will serve. And the only answer for the church is Jesus Christ. Before we go further, I want us to take a few minutes and pray to invite the Lord to speak to our hearts. I invite you to come to the altar. But before we even have the the prayer of response to the word of God, let's go to the Lord and ask God to move in us.